They got a few sponsorships. I saw them on TV. Hi, I'm Andy. And I'm Roger. And welcome to The Middle, where we try to have thoughtful conversations about awkward topics on our search to find the middle. That's that phobic. I don't feel war. I just own our way to see war. A few moments ago, Buckingham Palace announced the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. I act as if God exists. Put your masks on. How dare you? You have stolen my dreams and my childhood with your empty words. How you doing? Not too bad. I almost got my head chopped off by a fan the other day. Oh, man. What happened? Well, I was sitting down. I didn't think um, we had any fans. <laughs> we've got a few dangerous fans, I think. Yeah, that's, that's how we like them. <laughs> So I was uh, sitting in the living room and then I just hear this this big crash and I'm like, what the fuck was that? And then I had a look in the room, like this is this is our bedroom and the bloody ceiling fan just fell. Um, it was on like and it, it just fell from the, the, the ceiling. Um, lucky we weren't in there, but like it would have been, yeah, it would have just been like, because it's over the bed, right? So it would have just been crashed like right on whoever was there. So oh, Crazy. So it fell in the bed? Yeah, yeah. So that's my. Oh um, man, you got to call the. Uh, you got to call the landlord. <laughs> Do you have um one eight hundred reverse? Uh... <laughs> yeah. So was um. I do wonder that. Uh, you know, every now and then you do see something fall from the ceiling, and you just think, oh man, how often must this happen that people get hit on the head or something with like you know, a light fixture or a fan or whatever it is. Well, fa- ceiling fans, are, it's actually quite heavy. Like I know that the actual blades, if they hit you or, you know, you put your hand up and the blades touch your hand, like it's a fairly light sort of force, but the actual th- motor itself, I mean, obviously w- when we bought the house, it was there. So we didn't install it. And uh, I wasn't aware that it was a thing that you had to do regular maintenance checks of, of fans, <laughs> ceiling fans and the like, but um, maybe yeah, there can be a business for fans, right? Like, you know, in the same way that, People come into apartments and they check the fire alarms and they put that little thing and make sure the battery is working. Maybe someone can check all the fixtures. Definitely changed my outlook because I just presumed that these things were pretty solidly attached to, to the ceiling, but uh, not so much. You know what they say about assumptions. Bet you wish you had that weighted blanket. Have you seen that advertised now? Weighted blankets? I thought you said wet blanket there. And I said, I don't, you don't have to um, tell me what you do in your spare time. <laughs> that was one time and I was very drunk. And I, I still don't remember it to this day. So I'm still not convinced that someone didn't secretly come in and pour a glass of water on top of me. But have you heard about this stuff? Weighted blankets. It's yeah, become well, really popular now. Well, apparently, isn't it? like soothing it it helps people to um feel more relaxed yeah. or, but isn't it I strange right so it started off as a tool for uh, autistic people right that actually the feeling of a uh, weight on you uh, and that kind of constrainment actually reduces anxiety and helps them sleep but they've now selling them to the general public and finding that it does have some benefits as well or maybe being autistic is actually underdiagnosed i'm not sure one or the other this isn't just something you've seen in the snm line that you've um, been researching <laughs> no wonder it was so expensive. What I don't understand, right, while we're on that topic, right, like toys have never been cheaper. It is so like cheap to buy silicon and plastic and all this stuff. Yet when you go into a sex shop and you see like a big double-ended dildo, it's so expensive. Why is it so expensive? Like is it the quality is machine, the silicon is higher graded? I just don't understand. Um, but anyway, a bit of a segue from your fan. <laughs> um, so right. about Ukraine. Um, what did you um, think uh, after listening to our uh, social media episode last week? You know, for me, it was really a trip down memory lane. Like I was just thinking about, I can't separate the social media episode with me being a teenager and finding out about the internet in general. And so it brought back all these like amazing memories. Like you said, how like Wild West it was back then, the kind of boyish humor and, and the locker room talk. And yeah, it just kind of, it all came flooding back for me, all those horrid, videos and dial-up <laughs> pornography and all sorts of weird things um, that you see for shock value when you're a kid, you know, it's like that coming of age. Yeah, it's pretty um, incredible just how unregulated both in the like legal sense but also the, you know, just even just the decorum of the internet was <laughs> yeah. there, were, there weren't any rules developed yet. I don't know if you've seen a documentary about the, um, the whole, uh, about the whole QAnon thing and how that sort of came out of the, 4chan, 4chan. And, yeah but there's this documentary where they show like the guys who 
you know, administer it and they're like, it's alleged that they're the, they're the ones that came up with the whole QAnon conspiracy and they're like based out in the Philippines. They're these like American guys from the, from the you know, but li- that live in the Philippines and it's just, <laughs> just so crazy. Yeah. And and then there's like the, the dark web as well. The dark web that, that missed me in my sort of youth sounds like a bit of a hellhole. I mean, the dark web was absolutely real. It was actually incredible when you think about it, being able to go onto this place in the internet and essentially access illicit substances and illegal activities and all sorts of things um, right from your from your home and through your through your computer i mean we talked about the public square and you know kind of how social media owners platform owners sort of have this power and influence and I guess thinking back on that i'm interested to sort of get your views around sort of like deplatforming and <laughs> um, you know some of those free speech issues and which are, which are not quite social media topics, but I guess they're relevant to the extent that um, yeah. deplatforming can, can happen on social media. I think that um, it, it really depends on the context, but I don't envy the people that are trying to make these decisions, right? But I feel that in a lot of cases, if it's not handled right, it's similar to like martyrdom, right? When you deplatform some of these figures, you think you're cutting off them off from their base and they can't spread their you know, their hate or whatever it is, but sometimes it does make them a bit bigger, right? And gives them that infamy. So it needs to be handled, handled in the right way. Some people absolutely need to be taken off. You know, there's, this is the middle and there's absolutely a middle ground where you can do that responsibly, right? With the right kind of, you know, governance. I was actually listening to um, a podcast today where Sam Harris was talking about this and he he talked about in the, in terms of like the uncanny valley. So there's, Mm -hmm like a point where if they're really extreme, it's almost like you can actually have them on as a sort of a, like a specimen sample of like- Behind the glass. Yeah, I mean, but like the moment you sort of, yeah, let's say you walk back from like the really extreme examples and you get people who are sort of fringe, like if you've made them big, then you're actually then accountable for it. So it's like, and then where's the line and how do you sort of manage that? Yeah, it's definitely a tricky landscape. On another note though, we touched on this, but we didn't really go into detail about just the fakeness of social media. I don't know if you've ever come across this, but you've seen someone from perhaps from work or an acquaintance or even from way back in school, and you look at their Instagram account or their Facebook account, and it looks just like paradise. But we're now <laughs> of an age that's too, we're too old to be fooled by any of that, right? We, we know <laughs> the realities of what life brings and you know that having kids and a job and all this kind of stuff is is not very glamorous, but it can be curated in a way that looks absolutely amazing. Just as you're saying that, the example that sort of came to my mind, because I think as I mentioned sort of last week, we're booking accommodation for an upcoming trip overseas. And, you know, I I know this is not social media, but nonetheless, I, you know, as you're choosing hotels, you look at... (laughs) It's like a dating profile. (laughs) Yeah, like you look at all the photos and... You know, you get the um, pro shot photos or whatever, and it looks amazing. Um, but I make sure, always make sure I go to like TripAdvisor and look at the traveler photos, which where they like <laughs> usually have like people have taken photos of like pubes in the sink or whatever, and you get a real much uh, a much more real picture of and it. It just, but like you can apply that like that's for a hotel, but like that that works for virtually anything in life. Like the very best photo you can take of yourself is, is, is never what people are like usually. It's so good, isn't it? Like, do you remember in the very early days of Facebook where you could go into someone's profile and go into their photo section and there'd be a lovely, you know, this is our trip to Mexico and, you know, this is us on the Gold Coast tanning in, in bikinis. But then if you click the photos of this person, it was exactly like what you're talking about in TripAdvisor where it's other people that have taken photos of them and tagged them. And, you know, when you take a photo of someone, you don't give a shit what they look like. You only care about what you look like, right? And so, like, the, inevitably, they're always, like, horrible photos. <laughs> and, and I'm talking, like, way back when people still had point-and-shoot cameras and, you know, you didn't have red eye reductions and people would have, like, red pupils and irises and things and, like, all these horrible photos um, and I used to think that was hilarious because it's so glamorous on the photos they took on their profile. But if you just went to ones that were tagged in, it was a hot mess. All right. So we better crack on with this week's episode. Let's get into it. So Andy, what's your, um, what, what's your experience growing up and attitudes towards sport in your household? So I come from a household where two boys, I wasn't really into sport myself. I just never took to it. But my brother was, he was into particularly football or soccer, depending on how you want to put it. Um, and he played that quite competitively, I think, with the support of my 
parents to do so. But for me, it was I was never into it at all. And in some ways, I probably got a bit turned off it because... Dragged around? You know, it just wasn't my thing. And I got dragged along to all the soccer games and all the, the rest of it as a kid that I just I associated it with something boring. So I'm actually quite uncompetitive when it comes to sport. How about yourself? Yeah, I, um, you know, actually, uh, I didn't play much team sports. I, I played tennis very competitively when I was younger. Um, and I had some experience in a bit of martial arts, but, uh, yeah, uh, we, we didn't have a huge sporting culture. My dad was quite a good athlete. And so we were always active, but we didn't have a real culture of that, you know, going to see games or following local teams as much. I think we, we followed the, um, the rugby a little bit as a kind of like a cultural element, but nothing, nothing crazy. But I, I guess, so the reason we're talking about this today I suppose is we're, we're looking at a hot topic, which is women in sport. It's been getting a lot of airplay at the moment. It's, it's something that's quite interesting. So wait, hang on. Are you talking about women's sport getting a lot of airplay or women's sport being interesting or the topic itself of women trying to play sport being interesting and getting a lot of airplay? Uh, basically, women on the news talking about how women's sport is not getting a lot of airplay. <laughs> okay. All right. Good to clarify that. But, you know, I mean, we come from a sporting nation, right? So Australia is a relatively small country. What are we, 22 million people? And um, we are definitely overrepresented in a number of sporting codes uh, internationally, right? We, have, we do very, very well for a country of our size at the Olympics. Um, and we have lots of representation in all sorts of codes when it comes to, you know, things like swimming, uh, of course, our tennis, our rugby, the wallabies, a whole bunch of things, right? Um, our hockey teams are well-renowned things like that. So we definitely come from a sporting background and we're very proud nationally of our um, sporting heroes and our icons. But I guess there's always been this underlying tension around female athletes and their quest for equal kind of rights, I suppose, equal pay and how that kind of plays out in the rest of our society. Now, you don't, you, you said that you only have brothers. I have an older sister and um, I'm trying to rack my brain on the memories of her and sporting. And um, I've got to say they're not very, <laughs> not very strong. But I will say that she was still very much encouraged in the same way I was to participate in sport. So I don't think, at least in, on my family level, that there was a difference in the kind of encouragement and opportunities that she was given. But I'm not sure that would be the same across the board. So, Roger, um, Australian Open is on at the moment. Have you been watching uh, much of the tennis? Oh, I've been devouring it. So actually, I've just got a subscription to one of those streaming sports services, and I never used to have that. And it's been a real, uh, you know, game changer, overused term on how to kind of consume sport, especially tennis matches that are quite long. You can kind of have replays. So I've been watching a lot of matches. Um, I've had a real resurgence in my love of tennis. Can I ask, um, what's the balance of men's versus women's tennis that you've been watching? <laughs> well, you know what? I think... Um, Tennis is one of the more mature sports in this aspect, uh, in this respect. So, by the nature don't, don't, of, but don't lie. You, you you've watched no, more I, of. Uh... I'm not. <laughs> I'm definitely not lying. So I end up watching quite similar amounts, um, maybe like two thirds a third. And the reason for that is that the matches are shorter. So especially in Grand Slams like the Australian Open, for the men's they play best of five, and the women's is best of three. So the, the games for the women are over very quickly, very quickly. Okay. Pop quiz. Who's the number one women's player in the world at the moment? Swatek. I'm, I'm trying to like hook you on the, <laughs> I'm trying to hook you on something. Next question. Do you prefer to watch men's tennis or women's tennis? I do. I'll, I'll be, I'll be totally on the side. I prefer to watch the men's tennis. Okay. I've oh, got him. See, such a misogynist. <laughs> But today we're, we're really talking about a lot of the controversies surrounding women's sport, particularly as it relates to things like equal pay, equal maybe respect, if you like. And I think, you know, tennis is a good place to start because, like you said, it's one of the more egalitarian sports in that men and women, in terms of prize money, I think they're equalized really across certainly the major tournaments and yeah. um, and I think, you know, it's probably the only sport, popular mainstream sport I can think of where men and women sort of seem to get relatively e equal um, equal footing in terms of prominence. Though that said, the, the men d still do, you know, 
have the final on the Sunday rather than the Saturday. So um, <laughs> there are a few areas where um, that's not the case, but yeah. yeah. Tennis definitely is a step ahead in this respect. And I think part of that's to do with the culture. Uh, it's a mature sport and it's kind of still has that kind of gentleman cultural elements to it. Like, you know, Wimbledon and there's etiquette involved in tennis. It's not a big rowdy drinking culture. And so I think they've been able to reach that point a bit faster. Now, let me be clear though, uh, female tennis players are still fighting for equal pay. So the pay is equalized in the major tournaments, but definitely not across all of the tour. So there's only four grand slams a year in that format where the prize money is equal, but there's, you know, hundreds of other events happening. These people travel for over 30 weeks of the year playing in tournaments, and they're definitely not equal between the men and the women in terms of prize money. So one of the controversies in tennis has been some of the male players saying, hey, we play five sets and you know, we have these really <laughs> tough, physically tough games that, that go on for hours and hours and hours on end. We bloody well damn well should be paid more for what we do. Plus, yeah. just to add an, another layer, there would probably be others who would say, plus we're better tennis players too, right? So I guess really what we should really get to the heart of today is, is there any justification in 2023 for women to be paid less? Uh, we're talking about tennis where it's a highly commercial environment where there is actually a lot of money sloshing about anyway, but I think these issues become a lot more tricky when we start to get some different sports, for example, women's football or soccer, where there is just such a divide in terms of the amount of money in men's football than there is women's football. And then you have stories like, you know, the, the men's football team being put up on private jets to get to wherever they need to go and then the women ha having to get sort of cattle class flights sort of thing at their own expense. So what's your take on the whole um, pay situation? Yeah, look, like we can handle this a little bit more conceptually, but I think I'll start with tennis and respond a bit more directly to some of those challenges and the common narrative that goes around. So I think if you ask anyone around, okay, in a grand slam, if women are getting paid the same as men, then they should have to play under the same conditions. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? Now, women obviously play best of three sets. The matches are shorter. Uh, men play best of five. I'm okay with that. I actually quite like that. But you have to remember that tennis is a spectator sport, and that's why it has so much money and sponsorship. And they are looking at ways to continually reduce the duration of the game. So the tour and the Grand Slams really don't want the women playing for five sets, right? It takes a lot of time. It's harder to hold attention. The tele, you know, the, the schedule's a mess. So really, they don't really want to do that. Even with the men's game, they've taken active measures over the years to reduce that through tiebreakers, super tiebreakers, all these kind of things to make sure the matches don't go for you know four, five, six hours um, for for a range of reasons. So that's one factor that influences that. The other is that remember, Grand Slams are only the only five set formats, and there's only four a year the vast majority of tennis they're playing, even the men, they're playing best of three and sometimes even less for the newer tournaments. And in that way, they are playing exactly the same format as the women. So I think this idea of like, oh, that's, you know, yeah, you should get, you, you get paid the same or you would get paid the same if you do the same work, I don't think really holds up in, in the tennis world. So that's number one. For, this, for the second item regarding tennis, before we move on to other codes, are male tennis players better than women? Let's be real. The clear answer is... Yes. And I think throughout time, you know, we had the battle of the sexes and things like that with Billie Jean and all this. And even Serena Williams challenged, I think, a male player on the tour that was kind of upwards in the couple of, I think it was like 300th or 400th or something and um, lost in straight sets. There's no question to anyone who knows anything about tennis that the men's game is incredibly competitive compared to the women's game. Um, the athletes are stronger, they're faster, they have more endurance. There's just not a comparison there to be made. So it raises the point that we'll get to in other codes, which is, is it the like how good the athlete is or is it how entertaining the product or the sport is? Because I think there's a, there's a real difference there. But I think it's a moot point that, of course, the men, I would say, ranked in the top 500, 600 would pretty much decimate any woman in the top 20. And I think that's, that's not something that is very contentious. I mean, there are very few sports where that isn't the case. I mean, there are some sports... That I mean, I suppose something like gymnastics, you know, I don't might be yeah. different, but you know, more generally, most sports that's the case, right? But I think something you said where it's you know, entertainment, right? That, like, at the end of the day, 
the only reason there's money in sport is because people pay either directly to watch it or indirectly because it gets sponsorships or whatever. So it's in some ways like I'm, you know, a, a irrelevance whether men and women are, are better or worse at, at the game fundamentally. It's what kind of theater are you cooking up or what kind of entertainment are you cooking up for, for, for the audience. But I guess where this gets a little bit more challenging is that when you look at the fundamental commerciality of men's sport versus women's in some ways it's even more profound than the differences between i mean tennis is a bit of an anomaly but like men's sport is also much more uh com- like can be commercialized way better because men traditionally watch more sport than women men have incumbency so when you th- thinking about like like leagues and sport competitions they've they're already set up. They've got right. like, like the legacy yeah. advantages. People who are interested in watching sport generally want to watch the best. They don't want to watch what's perceived to be a second-rate product. So to kind of, and I agree, and to wrap some of that up, I suppose the male on the top of the game of their code would always have an advantage and most certainly succeed over the top of the top tier female in the same code, right? Like I don't think that is a very controversial view if you if you really think about it. And then so we start to talk about entertainment and like if I code hop for a second into something like MMA and we take something, an organization like the UFC, then you start to get into a bit of the nuance here. It's actually not about the biggest, the best, the fastest, the strongest. That's not really why people are drawn to sport. People are drawn to sport because of the drama. Like you don't know what's going to happen. Well, it, no, but it does depend on what you're talking about, like a different sport. If you're a fan of football, for example, you want to watch brilliant football. You don't want to watch, you know, third rate or even 100th rate football, right? Um, yeah, but what I'm talking about, Andy, is that you can have incredibly um, high performance competition constrained by a certain category. And so what I was about to say was, say something like the UFC or even in boxing, there is incredible attention and sometimes weight classes that may not be the heavyweight, they might not be the the biggest, the the fastest, the strongest, but so take like someone like Conor McGregor in the lightweight category, because the sport has natural boundaries around weight classes and structures and things, you can have an incredibly entertaining match that has all the natural drama that someone wants out of a sporting event, but still within those things. So I think it leads to a different conversation around what makes a sport fair and how do you build that drama regardless of the uh, natural athletic capability of some of the athletes. So I think in that particular case, if something is appealing to spectators or an audience, it's going to naturally attract fans. It's going to naturally attract viewership, sponsorship, dollars, money, and women athletes are going to be paid commensurate with that level of popularity i think the contemporary debates though have been around well we have had historically arrangements where we've left it up for lack of a better way of putting it the market to decide so we've left it to the market to figure out you know what the remuneration should be and we but we don't like where that leaves us because it's it, it's just such an anomaly right so you know you've got single players in national football teams who earn multiples of the entire women's teams put together times 50, right? So that gets sort of pointed out and say that's like, and then a judgment is put on that and say that that's fundamentally unfair. And I think in tennis, maybe the extremes haven't been quite as much, but maybe some of the historical differences in terms of pay have related to, let's say the WTA tour, that's the women's side of the tour, their ability to compensate players with prize money to that extent because their revenue capacity is less than for the ATP tour, the men's side. So then we get into this thing as, well, should we have some active cross-subsidization? Should we have some active kind of, no, no, let's put the market to one side for a minute and manually adjust it. And I think that's the heart of what I think we should talk about today. Yeah. And like, you can skin the cat in many ways, right? I, I also kind of sometimes think of it as like from a marketing perspective, it's like your product. Do you have a compelling product in the format of your sporting code and the rules and your athletes and how that plays out for audiences? And then the second part is like the promotion. Like, are you actually promoting the code in the right way for 
in, in this scenario, specifically women, right? So I think those two things, they're two pieces of the puzzle or two levers that you can just to help the situation. And some of that does involve propping it up, like subsidizing it in a way. And there are lots of ways that that could, that could happen if the appetite is there. Sometimes it's not from the incumbents. I mean, like where would you say, Andy, is the good examples of female sporting codes being lifted up by their male counterparts? Well, I mean, anytime you have combined funding arrangements, like let's say we're talking about the Australian Open. Uh, we, I, we should probably get off tennis because it's not even like it's probably not even the best example, but just to give a, a really basic example, right? So the Australian Open is, you know, I presume one entity and I'm not sure exactly the governance arrangements, but, you know, the, the WTA and the ATP in terms of prize money. But, you know, the Australian Open or Tennis Australia gets a single pot of money when it sells viewership rights to TV broadcast networks around the world, right? And in that case like when we're talking about men's and women's tennis. And remember, we're talking about a sport that is actually a lot more equal than in terms of like mainstream commercial popularity for men and women. But even still, female players receive 41% less media coverage than male players in, in tennis during the last four Grand Slams. And when you look at viewership, there might be some anomalies when maybe Serena Williams makes the final of a US Open because she's homegrown, she's from a very big market and so on. Similarly, last year when Ash Barty made the final and won the Australian Open, you know that was um, a, a very good viewership um, result for, for Channel 9, the women's final. But nonetheless, over the average, men's sport is viewed more than women's sport. And so when you have these broadcast deals, and that's where a lot of the money comes from, if you are sort of saying, well, we need equal pay for men and women, that would be an example. Now, just to be clear, I'm not prosecuting that it shouldn't be the case, but that would be one argument. Yeah. I mean, look, I think going back to to this comparison and like what makes a, a match compelling, I think maybe we should move over. We should, again, jump codes into soccer, right? So I want to talk about an example here between the, the female teams and, and the male teams, right? So are you across the kind of upset that happened and the, a bit of the media coverage of the Australian women's national team in 2016. Yeah, so they lost to the Newcastle Jets under 15 side. And what was the score? Uh, 7 nil. 7 nil. So I think this was one of those situations where there was a lot of uproar in the media saying, you know, this match shouldn't have happened. and But then there was other people from other sides saying, how can they be asking for more pay and more sponsorship when they're losing to, you know, the under 15 boys team, you know, regional team. And it does make it a very hard argument when they're, these kind of differences are so stark. Like, how would you convince viewership in that situation? I guess is the question. So, I, like, I still think there's two gateways here, right? The first gateway is what do they get paid? What is the right amount they should be paid? And for me, it still comes down to the fact that they will be paid an amount of money that depends on the commerciality of the product. Is it a product that people want to buy? So, if they can attract fans into the stadium who will pay money for tickets and those people at home that want to watch it and that generates money, that's how much they will get paid. It does not matter at all if there's an under 15 side who can beat them, okay? It's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. What matters fundamentally is do people want to come and see them play? So this idea that that we do some sort of objective assessment of Serena Williams beat, you know, the 400th ranked male player in the world. Like it, it doesn't matter. Like Serena Williams can fill the stadium <laughs> and can command all the, all the money in the world, right? She doesn't have to defend herself in that respect. And similarly yes. here with the, with the Matildas. Yes, but the Matildas are not filling stadiums. No. Well, increasingly women's soccer is up on the up. The second gateway is then is it unfair that women – like as maybe even just to make a meta assessment of society, right? Is it a flaw in society that the Matildas don't fill stadiums in the same way as the men's side would, the Socceroos would? Is that is that it, can we reflect upon us as a society and say spectators who would go and see the Socceroos play should look at themselves in the mirror and have shame upon themselves because for as many Socceroos games they've been to, they haven't been to a single Matildas match. <laughs> And and I think that's where you'll find a lot of pushback because that's when you'll find 
Football fans say no because the quality of the football is shit, and I don't want to watch shit football. And I've got and I've got proof. Yes, and and I and I should just say at the outset, I have zero athletic ability here. So me calling the Matildas shit, um, I, I'm very happy to um, to to cop that. But that's why people don't go, right? Yeah, and I, I think it's it is a very dangerous road to go down. Like you can take this gender lens across anything that you consume, right? Like I could ask you, Andy, like. What's the percentage of male comedians you consume versus female comedians? And it'd be a, well, you, you can answer that. What I could probably draw an equivalent to is like rock rock and roll bands, right? Yeah. Um, so it's, it, there's lots of domains where you have this, right? Exactly. So my point is that taking that one view on it, it can be quite complicated. And I'm not suggesting that there are not cultural or unconscious bias behind some of these things like... Comedians is a great one, right? Like some people just go, I just don't find women funny. And obviously that's coming from a place of, you know, a, a complicated place of bias, but also maybe the, the exposure is not there or they haven't given them a chance or whatever it is. But um, I think it's a dangerous place to come into it. I would say on the, on the soccer though, we have the A-League here in Australia that televises uh, soccer and they have actually taken an approach to combine what they used to call the, I think it was the W League, for the women's kind of league in soccer, but now they've kind of molded it even more and put it on the same promotion. So I think it's the A-League, men's A-League, women kind of thing. Um, so they've chosen an approach of kind of melding it together, like you've said, to kind of prop up each other and support and, and grow that code. So there are there are codes that are, that, that are doing this, right, to kind of bolster the the female um, and the, the female athletes. I mean, that's that's just good marketing, if anything, right? But I think just at the core of it, and I've got in my mind the caricature, and it might be unfair, but the caricature of someone sort of complaining that the back page of the newspaper doesn't give coverage to that amazing win that the women's football team had. And they've got to go to page, you know, back like a small little bit on the back of page, you know, the seventh page in or whatever to, you know, they're a footnote or whatever. And that this is some sort of sexist, sort of misogynist sort of thing. But the reality is the the reason that that's where the that they're a footnote is because there isn't the viewership. But I think particularly with football, like for people who watch football religiously yeah. to go from the standard that they're used to to then the standard that you get in the very best of women's football, it's it's jarring for them, right? And they're just that's the barrier, right? That's why there isn't the crossover. So then there has to be this sort of active attempt to actually get over that and get past that and like i mean I, and i'm interested to, to hear your thoughts on this but maybe fathers that have young girls right want to promote that that's that you know this is this is what you could do you could be a footballer you know you shouldn't feel like this is for boys only so then that father who you know maybe before his daughter was born might have been that guy sort of slagging off women's football but now suddenly is actually proactively backing it because they want to send a message to their children about what they can be in this world. So, which is a different sort of thing, but like, that's where I think a lot of this is going because it's just saying, well, where we've been isn't necessarily where we need to go in the future. So what are some things we can do now to make sport more inclusive for girls, especially? Yeah. It's an interesting topic. Um, and of course, with a daughter, it's something that I'm interested in. There is like a really high participation rate of girls in sport in Australia. And there's also, I suppose, a high drop off. And, you know, that tells me that there are some cultural elements at play. You know, you, you could take something like netball, for example. Netball is huge for women, right? Like there's just so many leagues and there's so much kind of amateur netball out there. You think that there would be an interest in viewership and, you know, be very commercially, you know, successful, but it doesn't seem to translate. I'm not really sure why but i do think that the bias that i was talking about before when it comes to women in sport does start early because there's a reinforcement around the masculine nature of sport in some codes in, in lots of little subtle different ways right there are no matter how i'll, I'll kind of turn it turn it inwards for a second with my daughter no matter how careful you are to try to keep that gender neutrality it's very very hard right like i actually do believe girls still are drawn to slightly more feminine pursuits in a lot of ways. And there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like I'm not saying all girls, but my experience has been that you can try to offer it and promote it and try to create a space or a culture that 
um, is understanding and, and is positive around sport and, and, and all kinds of pursuits and try to strip that away. But there is still a draw. And whether that's they're picking that up from other areas and other parts of um, their interactions at school and friends and whatever, maybe, but it is very hard to escape. And as a result, I think that girls, essentially, little girls get less time on the field, so to speak, with certain sports. They're praised less for it, potentially, in social circles. And as a result, you know, there's less investment in it, which kind of obviously plays out during the course of a lifetime. And yeah, that's that's a shame. But at the same time, you have to respond to what your kid's interested in and what they're gravitating towards, right? You can't bend them towards something. So really... I see my job as a parent of providing a environment opportunities and support, but essentially letting, letting them walk through the door themselves. Sorry to interrupt the podcast. Andy and I have really enjoyed doing this. And while we don't want your money or anything like that, it's been great to see the number of our listeners grow since we kicked things off last year. The best way for us to reach more people is word of mouth. So if you'd like to support us, then we'd be really grateful if you could share it to a friend or someone that you think might enjoy the podcast. We know there's a conversation for everyone. So please pick an episode that you think that they'd like and share away. That ends our shameless plug and we'll return you now back to the episode. I mean, social change is so hard it takes so long because there's so many countervailing forces so just thinking about the schoolyard right for a minute uh boys like there's a huge self-reinforcing feedback loop for boys to be trying and excelling at sport because being a good athlete among your peer group is it's like a badge of honor right it's something that earns you respect and credibility you know gets the girls or whatever as well whereas i think for Girls, it's different. Like girls aren't necessarily impressed by. Well, I'm. I'm assuming here, like you know, I've I've never been a, a girl in the schoolyard, but it seems to me that <laughs> oh, really? like the 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 dimension of um, status doesn't give as much. Well, I, like I'm pretty confident in saying that boys get a lot more out of being the best athlete in the school than than a girl would, right? Because if anything, a girl who's seen as the best athlete at the school might be seen as a tomboy or in a very um you know, disparaging way that's not fair, really. Yeah, and it's reinforced by a lot of different things, right? And um, it's the collective nature, the collective weight of these things. I'll give you an example, right? Like my daughter, when she wears like a dress or even her school uniform uh, that's um, a tunic, I like her to wear shorts underneath, right? Because it means that she can be more active and she can roughhouse a bit more and participate in sports or whatever it may be. But she has already learned from her peers or wherever or watching movies that like that's not that's gonna ruin the dress. You know, like I don't only the lame kids wear shorts underneath their dresses, <laughs> right? And so it happens so quickly, right? Like this idea of the feminine and and what's the right social thing to do and all those little things. So of course if you're not then okay, you're not wearing shorts under your, your dress, then obviously you can't you know, you're wearing a dress, like you're not going to be as physically active and as kind of ready to play sport and other things like that than the boys that are in shorts. We should put boys in skirts that would um, address the... Um... Yeah, <laughs> kilts. Calm down, Harry Styles. But yeah, you know what I mean? So like it is it is tough and you do see it. But I will just also throw in another thing that there is like, there also is a bit of biology in there as well, right? Like we've talked about a lot of the social elements and the, the gender kind of theory here and uh, sort of you know the influences here the feminine influences but biomechanically there are some differences i would say in across the board when you see coordination like i think there is something it is practice and is exposure but there's also a little bit there from the start around throwing and running and, and balance and things like that that you do see a little bit of differences between boys and girls in my opinion you know see, seeing a, a girl throw a ball compared to a boy there's usually quite a lot of difference there and some of it is learned, but I think there's a little bit there from, from the start as well. I mean, I'm not going to pinpoint exactly what explains it, but there's no doubt to me. Like, so, I mean, if, if there were a suggestion that no, 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 boys and girls could be equally good at any given sport, they just need to be given the right environment to excel at it, you know, at, at an early age. Like, I think, no, 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 like the sex that you're born into, like whether you're male or female does give different physiological benefits so in some ways that's actually why you know back to the serena williams example i look at serena williams and like i almost sort of give her more kudos because she has excelled in in the women's side of of the comp as a an exemplar that's far above her peers 
like so even though yeah i mean we you know we've said you know she might not beat the level 300 or whatever you know whatever that figure is you you are watching someone who of within a certain category and given certain constraints has absolutely excelled and within those parameters has like that's that's a that's something like a human achievement a a human accomplishment but i guess the, the suggestion that i mean there's a reason that men are always like on whatever metric um, particularly when we're look, looking at, say, swimming or athletics or whatever, it's always the men side of the equation where the world records are quicker, faster, higher, whatever, and that is that is physiological. Yeah, and I, and I think people can be intelligent enough to hear the words and not go, oh, you know, Andy and Roger are saying that, you know, a woman can never beat a man or never can overpower a man or whatever. Absolutely not. We're, we're saying at the top, the highest echelons of a particular sporting code there will be a significant advantage to the men compared to the female athletes in that code. Yeah. Absolutely, could uh, Ronda Rousey beat the shit out of us? You know, <laughs> like, and just because we're men, we have some advantage over a trained martial artist. No, that's not what we're saying. It's significant advantages at the upper ends of professional athletes, right? Do you think you could beat Serena Williams in tennis? Of course not, but uh, I'd love to try. I, uh, I just back to the women's football. Have you seen on YouTube like those videos of kind of they're, they're like usually compilations? So, so I want to talk about two things through this. So, the first is like there are these compilations of you know like the worst of women's football, right? And they've got like examples of elite sort of teams and the like, but where they've just done these real clangers, like so they've kicked the ball, like the goalie kicks the ball in the goal or something like or they go for a free kick and it they're 180 degrees off you know just really wild sort of out there but the one thing in some ways that makes it funnier it isn't that someone's cocked it up but that the common the commentators like almost don't jump at it like it's so it's it so they're like oh just miss just miss to the side there <laughs> like as whereas the it'll be it'll be they'd be laughing their tits off right because it would be the funniest thing in the world to say, oh my god, what's he been? Well, he had a brain explosion. That's yeah. Whereas amazing. they, in the women's, uh, the commentators are barely acknowledging that it, that it happened. <laughs> but I do feel like women need to be treated with a bit more respect because there is a bit of misogyny, right? So that that YouTube compilation example is itself, you know, comes out of almost this like disparaging. We're gonna laugh at you, sort of yeah. coming from that place. I view sport as a very masculine culture in a lot of elements right like it's it's competition at its heart it's about dominance it's about all these things right and men go through that as well you don't have to go very far back in your life to think of a time in PE at school or on the field where you've experienced that kind of feeling of you know of um, being dominated or losing a match or, or or dreading a certain outcome or whatever it happens to men too right and I think that's the nature of sport and the kind of competition in a in a controlled way. And it is quite brutal, right? So I think it does have roots in that kind of thing. Now, whether it should or not, and whether there is bias towards women as a result of that, you know, I I, I don't support that. But I think it's a product of the culture, you know, in a lot of in a lot of different codes. Soccer is a great example. In many countries, it's a real like lad sport, you know, and the culture around the not only the the athletes but the people who watch it now from a feminist point of view i think there should be opportunities for anyone who's wanting to play a particular code you know women who want to play a code or, or whatever there needs to be opportunities there and i do believe you know i'm not a like a proper just let the market sort it out and make it a commercial product i feel a little bit more um softer than that you know my middle is is, is not there but i do think you have to understand that sporting is about kind of competition it does come from a bit more slightly more like brutal and background if if you know what i mean yeah one of the things that i think many male football fans or sports fans react to is like a feminist activist that wants to make a, a point about this right wants to really say or, or shine a light and, and make a a big deal about it and then a male sport fan would, would then ask back well how much sport do you watch you've turned this <laughs> into something that you think is a problem that you know women's sport doesn't get all of the attention that it deserves yet how much money do you spend on sport watching sport as a a fan of sport how much time do you spend how many football jerseys do you buy how many tickets to to games do you buy 
do you have the subscription to the cable TV so you can watch the games at 3 a.m. in the morning? And the answer is invariably no to not like zero to all of those. So, um, <laughs> and that kind of puts puts that perspective away. So I think you know because it's kind of like uh, you and veganism. Well, it's sort of like being told what you should <laughs> like, right? Yeah, no, I I agree, right? It's, and it comes from a different place. I think that kind of commentary comes from that feminist angle, and that's what it is. But of course, they probably don't <laughs> consume sport, so they might have the argument. Well, if I did, you know. But you do, so why don't you represent it equally? So that they might still have a way around that. Roger, I want to push back against something you said before, or if not push back, then understand a little bit more about your perspective. You said you're not sort of a let the market decide kind of person on this and that maybe that's not how you would kind of view it. Could you maybe explain that comment a little bit more and, and explain where you feel it should be? Yeah, I guess what I meant by that was like, to be total free market and ruthless, it's that, you know, you shouldn't subsidize or you shouldn't prop up maybe any code that doesn't stand on its own two feet. And I don't think that that is realistic for women in sport. I think that um, for all the reasons that we spoke about, uh, maybe investment early on or um, maybe perhaps they have a good product or they need certain tweaks to their product, but they're lacking promotion as well. You know, you could, I think that, there are ways and there are benefits of having a more di- more diversity in sport. So whether it's things like stacking um, them as an undercard. So for example, in the same way, there's a support act or there's an opener in a, a concert. Perhaps you could do that. Um, whether it's combined funding, like you mentioned, um, I'm, I think that you need sometimes that groundswell, that investment, that subsidization to kind of prop up a code before it becomes... Uh, pays dividends later down the track. I mean, okay, so to take what you've just outlined to me, I mean, that is really the market doing its its business, right? So one of the reasons why, I mean, you gave the example of the A-League, right? Stacking the, you know, trying to sort of almost present the women's game and the men's game as the same thing, just different sides yeah. of the league. But, you know, it's, it's classic. Like if you want to have growth in a business, you find new greenfield sort of opportunities and women's sport is is as a classic um one at that because it's below its potential or at least you know it, it it's less developed right so a lot of sports administrators would be looking at women's sport and saying well we are going to make some upfront investments here because we think it can grow to a, a certain level but they're doing that because they want to make money So I guess just to draw a line between that sort of a situation and perhaps a different form of, you know, because I see that as the market doing its business, right? But I think when we talk about sort of cross-subsidization or subsidies and all of that, I think we're probably talking about something a little bit different, which is where there's like some sort of societal expectation that they invest more than they would otherwise because it's, it's unjust if they don't, or perhaps we're talking about government spending more money to to build women's sport as in professional sport not grassroots participation in sport but actual professional sport yeah that's that's kind of what i'm referring to so not particularly in that example around the a league because they're a, like you said a business operating to get profit there but things like perhaps like a hockey team that's called medalist but they can you know not afford to pay for their own travel to get to events and things like that well just as an aside i think the men's hockey team probably has the same commercial constraints as the women's. They got a they got a few sponsorships. I saw them on TV. Just to pick hockey, right? That as one sport, it's probably quite dependent on either the amateur nature of the sport, in that you know the players aren't really compensated; they do it for the love of it, or they're on some smell of an oily rag type, you know, Australian Institute of Sport sort of contract or whatever. But there's not yeah, not a lot of money in hockey. No, I'm not. I'm not suggesting that they. They got the silver spoon out, but um, all I mean is, in those circumstances where there there is not a commercial product there, yes, there there may be for for different reasons there may be interventions that wouldn't exist in, I suppose, the brutality of a a pure kind of market system that like wants the demand for it. I suppose is what yeah. I'm saying. But like, why should the commercial aspect of it be subsidized? Like, why should taxpayers, maybe to be more specific? invest money in commercial women's sport as it, that doesn't make money, makes losses, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't need 
subsidies, right? What what's the rationale as opposed to like well, wouldn't it be wouldn't it be far far better to take whatever that money would have been and actually pump it into community sport and to actually encourage actual people to play sport? I think they think the two things are related, Andy. Like if you have the you know the highest echelons and the commercial aspects of the sports um, celebrating women that that will in turn have a positive impact the, the more community levels of that sport let's say the most prominent example of women's sports in in australia we might think of wafl women's nbl wnbl wnrl uh, here we talked about football like these are all commercial enterprises they don't they don't need subsidies from government so now wh- whoever runs those games might decide that well we're going to you know we're going to we're going to make some losses on this in the near run near term because you know we're, we're going to grow it into this thing in the longer term but again that's a commercial investment they're making so that's fine the market's doing its bit but some notion that you have government and i don't know that there's any prominent examples of government even doing this but just as a philosophical question the notion that you you're going to have government p- putting money into turn a product that isn't self-sustaining by definition because it needs government subsidy as opposed to putting the money into community facilities, like giving money to netball clubs or upgrading local sports. Like, that's nuts. That does not make sense at all. I mean, I think you'd find that uh, there is government funding in lots of commercial sports, though, regardless of, like, women and, and men. So, for example, it gives a huge chunk of money to the AFL. Why, why are they doing that, right? I'm not picking on women's sport um, necessarily, but I'm just, just saying as, as a general proposition, why would you have any investment in essentially co- a commercial endeavor that essentially you know are self-sustaining operations when you could be giving that money to I mean if you really cared about the objective of like you know promoting participation or whatever you could actually give it to the people who could use it like it costs hundreds of dollars to play sport right if you if you want to join a club like you've got to pay for the facilities the grounds and all that like why not have free sport why not cut that cost like why would we give money to to these commercial enterprises much less ones that don't make money yeah no it's a it's an interesting argument right like uh, i think and maybe we haven't gone there enough to like in terms of where in australia we choose to spend that money right like through the ais and then directly from the government right like so for example it's like 60 million dollars of funding across three afl clubs brisbane carlton richmond and one NRL club, North Queensland. These are still sporting codes that are bringing in millions and millions of dollars through viewership and and yeah. merchandise and all this kind of thing. Like th- that's isn't that like so? It's really my point is it's already occurring. Um, then that opens the door to a discussion around where that money is spent and how it's divided. Right? It's already happening. Should women's sport get the commensurate amount of you know kickbacks from government? Then yeah, fine, whatever. <laughs> but I guess. What I'm getting at is something a little bit more acute, which is should there be an active effort to change and distort the balance and pump money into something and build up something to an extent just for the pure purpose of addressing the fact that women's sport is not as commercial as men's sport. So, and maybe to put this more concretely, should, let's say, the government, I mean, we, we talked about pay before. If yeah. let's say let's say take AFL right and the women's AF the women's AFL league right, it, would it be appropriate for the government, a government, whether it's the state government or the federal government, um, or Elon Musk, um, to <laughs> give money to the WAFL to bring it the pay of its female players up to the average level of male AFL players? Would that be appropriate? Well, my view is no. But it, again, this is not. That that's not the subsidization that we were, we were originally talking about. That's just like the ultimate version of it, right? I guess I was trying to draw a distinction between the type of subsidization in the near term, in the short run. That, Like, I mean, if, if Cadbury wanted to launch a new chocolate bar, it would be taking money from its other lines of chocolate bars and it would be spending money to innovate, develop and set out and market a new chocolate bar. And that chocolate bar in the, in the short run would, would make a loss. And it would be compensated by the profits from all the other chocolate bars. But Cadbury will do that because eventually that chocolate bar will start making money. So I think that's what's happening with women's sport currently, where where they do 
promote it and all those sorts of things, even if it's not making money. But I guess what I'm talking about is should a government come in and give a leg up to that chocolate bar that's not doing quite so well, that's not that's not selling on the shelves because no one likes the taste of it, right? Should a government come in and um, buy up all the um, surplus um, chocolate bars so that um, Cadbury can continue making it? Don't you think that seeing like the professional athletes in your code, like female athletes, does inspire the younger generation to pick up that sport but that's that's the worst end of the spectrum to be spending your money on public money on right so it's far better to break like the 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 bigger barrier isn't that oh there isn't enough sort of role models the bigger barrier is that at the end of the day it's going to cost like a couple of hundred dollars to join or that there are cultural barriers within schools there's all sorts of different strategies you could have to break down the barriers but like yeah and i'm just saying this is one of them right because you know that you attract athletes from different codes into a particular code and some of that is having a professional nature maybe as an aside so so far we've talked about like promoting women's sport right and and almost like the aspirational side of it why what's the point for what reason why do we want to socially engineer in that way like this and like i'm asking this as a genuine question right it's not i'm not trying it's nothing rhetorical in this i'm not trying to say that we shouldn't but there are lots of domains where women are more interested in in those things than men are currently right and if sport is one of those domains where men are just generally more interested in it certainly in, in as being a spectator and and then you know all of the consequences that fall like does it matter should should we even care about this yeah i mean it's a, it's a good challenge and i i agree as you can probably tell from my previous comments around differences between girls and boys growing up and things like that right forcing them into choices um i'm so i go back to that i'm a believer of providing the opportunities right so if athletes female athletes want to participate then they should be able to with respect and dignity um but no i don't i don't believe that you should try to bend the will to tell people what they should be interested in and what they like of course not yeah because i i kind of feel like that's partly what a bit of this social engineering is trying to do right it's it it's like oh there's some intrinsic you know benefit and and the one thing that usually gets spoken about is one of like having active kids right that there's a need for both boys and girls to be active and and i get that argument except that we also don't have a subsequent conversation about we need to stop men from smoking eating pies drinking beer and having big fucking (laughs) beer guts by the time they reach 30 right like so women on average are healthier than men they live longer than men so maybe boys live if you sort of objectively look at you know that they're more active and that, and that that that's a good building block for living a healthy life maybe but at the same time like at some point that reverses and there's other <laughs> habits that that boys get into that that are actually bad so and we and like so sh- like this health argument and active kids I don't know. It's just it just feels a bit like is that really the thing that we should be targeting, or maybe it's maybe we should be looking at what boys are doing and what makes things go wrong in in terms of yeah their their upbringing and transition to adulthood. I think you've you've got a, definitely got a point around health. I think actually people who are avid sports watchers probably tend to be quite one of the most unhealthy. Um, gambling but, too. Yeah, gambling as well. But I would say that for for women, right, there is this thing if you. You know, we natural we're humans, right? We don't do what we're not good at. And if you um if you don't practice sport much, you don't get very good at it. And then you avoid it more, which makes it worse and worse. And then you might find out later in life that you just don't have a ticket to the game. You know, you don't you can't appreciate some of life's great enjoyments like you know, kicking the ball around or participating in certain types of um outdoor activities and things like that. So I think there is some benefit beyond pure health. Um, and then I also do think there are a lot of important lessons that sports does teach you that I think that often younger generations get criticized for, like, you know, dealing with loss, overcoming challenges, problem solving, um, sportsmanship, all these kind of things that are highly prized in, I suppose, traditional Australian cultures. Um, sometimes probably a bit overstated in my opinion, but there is something about having to deal with the humbling of defeat in sport and um, reaching your limits and things like that. There, there are definitely lessons and, and character building things there i mean i guess one of the things with sport they say is as well like like the, the solidarity of being in a team and team sport in particular yeah working with others and just the going through an experience like that with peers and you know just it's not just health as in physical health there's also probably mental health aspect too but and social 
well-being and so on. But yeah, I mean, I, I, I guess I'm trying to push back on this some of this stuff, not necessarily because I think it's a bad thing to be promoting and building up, but just, you know, I do think when we look at kind of these aspirations, you know, we, we should sometimes like take a step back and go, well, is it really is it really such a bad thing? Like, is the status quo really that bad? Like, and, and you could say that all of those things about other, so many other domains, like you'd say, well, you know, music, if you're, if you don't play an instrument, you know, you, you've lost this part of your life, but yeah. you know, a lot of people don't play an instrument and they don't care. Like they're quite happy. Like I'm sure there are a lot, lots of women who are as adults are quite happy with their current engagement in sport and they're, or lack thereof like it's it's just not a problem and you know maybe for boys it's if you think about all the things that boys could have done when they were younger that are may, maybe considered more feminine so i don't know i mean maybe visual arts for example oh you could have painted or i don't yeah. know you could have i'm not sure if that's necessarily a good example but there's no, i think um, it is i think it is there's so many things that yeah missed opportunities you know, you, but yeah you, you're kind of making me regret not asking this to mr will when we had him on for the teachers episode because i think that prior as a precursor to sports is actually pe it's it's all the physical gym education you do at school i think that that part of the curriculum could have like been handled so much better <laughs> you know and i think that starts for the alienation really hits home for for women i think in when you have to go through PE or sports at school, right? Everything about it, like the locker room, the kind of like all that kind of stuff, right? Dodgeball, like, I don't know if you have memories of playing fucking dodgeball, but that is just a horrible kind of sport if you're not into it, right? Like you're trying to not get hit in the face and embarrassed and and all this kind of stuff, right? And I can just, I would have asked Mr. Will how that's handled nowadays. I just wonder how much of that's just like toughening kids up just generally like, but no, I mean, I think you're right. Sport should ultimately be about like having fun and if it's not fun then i don't like for people i don't think we should be trying to push them into it if they enjoy it then great but if they yeah if they don't enjoy it like even if you're talking about from a health perspective like you shouldn't be forcing someone to like because of some notion that it's it's good for being active is good for their health like you shouldn't be pushing someone into like competitive sport yeah against their will like it's one thing to say oh well you still need to keep active and you know go for walks or Uh whatever that's one of the ironies whatever, though competitive but... sport is not good for the health <laughs> yeah that's right all right well, we've talked about a lot of different aspects of this today yeah i mean what's your middle it's um look i guess my middle is that sport has as kind of like a, a genre like i i do think that the move towards more accessibility more respect is a positive one for a number of like societal reasons but i don't believe in forcing people to kind of, you know, worship at the altar of gender equality when it comes to sport. Sport is a pastime, it's entertainment, it's all these things, right? And I don't think that you should interfere with that. I feel like you can create opportunities and environments of respect and all these things, but you don't need to to force people's hand, like in a heavy-handed way to you know, crank their neck around and turn them to, to look at something, which often feels like the case, you know, like a weird clockwork orange, like look at the screen because it's just not going to work. And I, I think it needs to happen more organically over time through innovations to the game and, and opportunities will present themselves. They always do. And there are lots of codes that are, that are doing it like tennis, like the UFC, um, female pins in the U- UFC are incredible. People love, they get great viewership. They've shown that it can work commercially. Um, and every code's different. They've got to overcome their own problems and their own challenges. Yeah, look, I, I think for me, I think you said something before around making things accessible and reducing barriers. I think like, I, I think I'm think i all for all of the e- easy things that can be done in terms of trying to make sure that um, girls aren't dissuaded from sport or aren't you know making sure it's it's something accessible to all and all of that but you know i guess um i probably have i mean we've especially when we're talking about like equal pay and stuff like that like i i think you know people have to be a little bit realistic that it's not sustainable to expect like on non-commercial terms for athletes of a category to be paid identically when there's orders of magnitude different abilities to commercialize it and that's just a hard truth, a hard reality. So women footballers will never get paid the same as the top male footballers. It's just, it's an impossibility. But then there might be like, I think where these sort of flashpoints come up is where, for example, they're traveling to the Olympics and you have the male 
football team flown first class and the female football team uh, flown economy and you have like maybe they're funded by the same you know national body or whatever and you look at that and you go well all right there might be some sort of argument where there's this component of the funding that you know may- maybe just make the um male players you know chip in for their own business class or first class tickets if they want to fly that way just at least like keep the equality there so yeah that's the respect thing right yeah but um you know and, and viewership and expecting fans to like give equal or try a bit harder and watch a bit more women's sport when they don't want to like i think that's a step too far too um and and judging people because they they're not into it like that's i think that's a step too far i think one thing that's clear though is that women's sport is the frontier and like particularly in a commercial sense so you know we haven't talked about but you know australia's actually hosting the women's world cup which is this year and I think they are, they are going to be playing in all the all the biggest stadiums, and you know, certainly when Australia plays, we'll probably fill them. So you know, it's a growth area, and um, that's why I think there is a lot of investment in in the game. Don't you think? Like, if you look at a code like the AFL, their objective fight all the time, right? Like the women talk about their short shorts and perving on their arms and stuff. Ah, uh, just going to make a lesbian joke. Hockey again, hockey again. <laughs>